so much for letting us uh, have this interview. Thank you. No, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, well, Monsters is my personal favourite film of the year. Um, but at what point during production did you begin to realise that you'd cross from a tiny independent film over into something that would get so much critical acclaim and would end up being shown all over the world? Um, we didn't. There's no, there's no real point. Uh, I still feel like we haven't in that it's still to be released in most places. Um, yeah, and I'm always, I don't want to like, I always get paranoid, like I don't want to count my chickens before they hatch type thing. So I always get paranoid that everyone's going to hate it or something. But um, no, I think the, the scariest moment is when we, no one had seen the film and we went to South by Southwest, the festival in Texas. That was a world premiere. And we literally ejected it out of the tape machine, got in the plane, went, shoved it in a hit play. And, uh, and crossed our fingers. It's like no one had seen it. We'd made the film that we really liked, that we were proud of, but are we just crazy? You know, maybe we're too close to it. And, and still, even then, you know, you show it to an audience, you have no idea what they think. Because when someone's in the audience, unless it's a comedy, when everyone's laughing, the, react, the look on people's faces of like being utterly gripped and emotionally traumatized by something is very similar to someone who looks bored and wishes they were home. You know, it's just like a you know, very similar state. And so, so we still didn't know. And, in, and then in the morning, it was things, it was like looking at the websites, like the blogs and the, what did people make of it? And that was the scary bit. It was like, I, I ran up a really expensive iPhone bill, just looking at every single person's comments. Um, and we had some nice positive ones. So it felt like, okay, maybe, maybe this will be okay. But uh, you never really know. I mean, it's gone well so far. Like, we'll see. I think the star's behind you. <laughs> yeah, we just lied about them, we just, just <laughs> photoshopped them in. So. Uh, you famously shot the film um, with just yourself and one other person on crew. Is this a template that you would repeat again in the future, or was it born purely out of necessity? Uh, it was born out of necessity. It was something that I wanted to do because I wanted as minimum impact on the environment we were in as possible, because I wanted I wanted all the people in the background to be real. I didn't want everyone looking at the camera and like, what are you doing here? Because what happens when you do a a, a film shoot is you kind of you, you land on this environment and you you push everyone out of the way and you put barriers up and you start creating your scene and and for me like on a low budget level that you get all your production value by letting everything in and like not stopping people walking past not stopping cars because then it looks I always find it really strange when you watch TV or watch films and you know that every single car that goes in the background is a production car that they've paid for and they've hired and they've got some stunt guy or actor to drive past it's just like that's why films are so expensive like when every single person walking down the street is an actor yeah. no wonder it costs millions you know you get them for free look out the window this for free why, why do you want to pay and do that and so it was very much like let's try to go and notice if i had my way i would have had a tiny camera that no one would have even spotted and we would have no one would have known we were even there but actually in, in actual fact i think having a big camera which we ended up having um, helped us a lot because you look professional. You don't look like some silly little student film. So when you turn up somewhere, you get more goodwill, actually. People are more like, what are you doing? Are we doing a film? And you look like, maybe you are. So they look, oh, come in. Uh, yes, do you want some food? You know, yo, you want to film here? That's fine. I think if we'd had one of these digital SLRs, what are you doing, a film? It'd be like, well, where's your camera? This is it. Oh, I've got one of those, you know. Maybe we would have had more of that reaction. So I think we had a happy balance in the end. Um, if, if Hollywood foolishly tried to remake your film, who would you, uh, who <laughs> who would you, you have? feel most comfortable with? Um, Cameron Diaz <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who is Scoot? I think Scoot reminds me of the reason I, I like Scoot for a lot of reasons, but one of them is he, he wouldn't, he'd hate this, but it reminds me a bit of a young, he's got a bit of Luke Skywalker about him, I think. Mm -hmm. Like that sort of Mark Hamill kind of thing. And sometimes from the side, he looks a bit like Bruce Willis. And, and sometimes, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, it's, uh, I kind of, it was funny, a few people before they saw the film were like talking about remaking it, like who owns the remake rights, should we remake it sort of thing. And what was a real nice compliment is they then saw the film and they didn't want to remake it because they were like, oh, well, you've kind of done it. Like, and it's American actors in America. You know, why would you remake it? It's not like let the right one in where, yeah. 
which stupidly, I mean, I think Let the Right One is an amazing film. Um, why would you ever want to remake that? But anyway, one justification is, well, it's not in English, right? That's the only real justification, if there is one, but there isn't. With this, it's like, well, what, why? Just because Brad Pitt's not in it. Like, I'd be really interested. We, what we should have done is shot... An, we should have had on the TV in one of the scenes the American version of this. With, if Brad Pitt had done a cameo and stuff, and they could have like, been really overly lit and be really kind of like, but we have to get back to America, you know. Yeah. That would have been a nice little detail in the background, I think. Yeah, it's known that you spent, um, well, I might be wrong, but around nine months sort of editing hundreds of hours of footage. Is there, are there any sort of really epic sort of three-hour versions of the movie that were There's kind a of reluctant to give up? Or? There was a four, nearly four and a half hour version of the film when we first cut it. I would never show you that and say, watch this, you'd love it, you would want to commit suicide. But um, it, there was, you know, when it got down to about two and a half hours, that's when it got tricky. We knew it had to get shorter because it felt too long. But it was like, well, which pieces do you take out? And it took a lot of trial and error to kind of, I kind of say it's a bit like that game Jenga where you, you pull bits out and try not to let it collapse. It was like that. Um, I mean, we're going to put stuff on the DVD extras. There'll be some deleted scenes and stuff like that. But I think, I mean, to be fair, this is pretty much the director's cut. Like, this is kind of like, we did have control over it. Um, there's a couple of things I miss in the film that I kind of would be fun to put in at some point. But I'm in no way want to do this George Lucas thing of special edition, then re-release edition and 3D edition. I just think... Like they say, art is never finished, it's abandoned. You know, I think that's just true, full stop. And there comes a point where you just go, that's it, that's the film. Like, you know, that I'm very happy with it, I'm very proud of it. So it's kind of, it's, that's monsters, that's what it is. Um, yeah, not to give spoilers, but the end of the movie, um, you know, beautifully and subtly, encourages repeat viewing. So at what sort of point in the editing process did you realise that framework was to place it? I have, okay, so, so I'll tell you a bad, a bad analogy, I mean, a bad. So yeah, I'm filming with the camera, it's a very heavy camera. I managed to do my backing quite badly, quite a lot, just carrying it all the time. And so we're in, we're in Mexico and I, I can't actually function because it hurts so much. They were like, oh, go and get a massage and get your back sorted out. And I was like, yeah, but where's a proper massage? And they were like, well, this lady over there, she does it. She does my back, you know, she's really good. So I went into this place and they played this tranquil music because they did all this, she did all this rubbing to my back and it was really helping. And it was the first time I got a chance to really think on my own and it was calm and and the big bone of contention with with me the producers everybody and the actors was that how the film ends there was this like is it a happy ending is it a sad ending you know is it an ambiguous ending you know there was all these different theories on how to end it and and as this woman's doing it after about an hour I'm totally relaxed and I'm playing through each version in my head she leans down and she goes um, she whispers in my ear um, happy ending and um, and she, this genuinely happened, and, and it was like, God, everyone's got an opinion, you know? And I don't want to spoil it for people, but we kind of have our cake and eat it in our film. And, um, yeah, there was a certain point in the... Actually, writing of it, to be honest, when we were developing it here, um, uh, it was like, I want this to happen, but this has got to happen. And then suddenly there was this moment of like, oh, hang on, we could do both. And, and don't want to ruin it, but... It is that kind of film. All I'd say to people is just, just don't be so monster obsessed when you see monsters um, and you might, you might have a different take on it than the person next to you. That's about all I can say. Okay, I was going to say, if, if you were forced to, uh, to make a sequel to it, what sort of angle would you want to take? Um, well, I like the idea. I mean, there's all kinds of things you could do. I mean, like, for a long time there were sequels, right? And then... People got bored of them, so they created prequels. Then people maybe are getting bored of them. So I like the idea of equals, which is a film set in exactly the same time frame as the original. So like maybe you pick a character whose paths would cross with Scoot and Whitney, and Scoot and Whitney would be like the background characters in this other character's film, and maybe, maybe this character is someone that appears in the movie sort of thing. Um, but that's just me joking. I mean, really, I... I think I'd like to revisit the world. I've really enjoyed the world we created. It was, it, you know, I like what we did there. But um, I think the real question is, like, 
and this is more of the, the, for the audience to decide, but is it like, this, is the sequel about Scoot and Whitney's characters or is it about the world? Because without ruining it for people, there's certain limitations with what we can do. And, and so, um, I don't know, I wouldn't rule anything out right now. Um, I kind of think it's good. A lot of people, they make a first film, then they have this career that then kind of crashes and burns and, and, and is rubbish. And then they go back and do their sequel to their first film again, like to say, I'm back. <laughs> and, and so, um, so maybe, I don't want to say anything that you can then replay in like 10 years when I'm doing Monsters 2, Electric Boogaloo. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think Vertigo are very keen to do a sequel, or at least continue on the world. We'll see what happens, like whether it be television or film. I know there's some conversations going on, so, um, so we'll see what happens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys! Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice.